Hong Kong, once Britain's gateway to the rich trade of the East, now lies like the rest of Asia under a cloud of uncertainty and unrest. With the communists in control of China, no one knows what the future holds for this small island and its mainland territories. But Hong Kong, meantime, is continuing with the trade that has made it one of the busiest ports in the world. Into the territory's 390 square miles are crowded nearly two million people. The population is almost wholly Chinese in origin, and the city of Victoria on Hong Kong Island is a curious mixture of West and East. The people of the colony go about their business apparently unconcerned but they wonder where Hong Kong fits into the communist master plan. The government remained strictly neutral during the Chinese Civil War, and when a dispute arose over the ownership of 80 Chinese planes in the colony, the aircraft were grounded until a legal decision was given in favor of the communist government. But Britain is ready to defend Hong Kong should the need arise. Here at the frontier, surface appearances belie the underlying tension. Relations between British and Chinese officials are strictly correct, and there is a continual flow of travelers backwards and forwards across the border. But everyone in the colony knows the situation could change overnight. They know that the future of Hong Kong depends not on the officers in the command post opposite, but on their masters in Peking. But meanwhile, Hong Kong is at peace. Not so Malaya, Britain's other trouble spot in Asia. Producing nearly half the world's rubber and a third of its tin, Malaya is especially vital to Britain at present as her richest source of dollars. After the war, rehabilitation of the tin and rubber industries was making good progress. But in June 1948, the communists, frustrated in their attempts to gain control of the Malayan trade unions, took to the jungle and started a campaign of murder and sabotage. The burning of this large rubber refinery near Singapore shows how effective their campaign has been. A state of emergency was immediately declared, and the Malay police force, British Army and Air Force strengthened to destroy the communists. Though the enemy number no more than 5,000, the jungle offers them excellent protection and rounding them up is proving a long, grim and costly process. The enemy are mainly Chinese who obtain supplies by extortion from the large Chinese population. So far, they have killed over 1,000 civilians and several hundred troops. And though more than 2,000 terrorists have been killed or captured, the job is by no means finished, and the forces are continually engaged in skirmishes like this. One man captured, the rest escaped to fight again another day. This engagement is only one of many that must be fought before the job is done. The patrols far from base have to be supplied, and the Royal Air Force, assisted by squadrons from the Australian and New Zealand Air Forces, are cooperating with the Army in dropping ammunition and food. Here, the crew of a Royal New Zealand Air Force Dakota are being briefed on their mission for the day. pilot and navigator are on the lookout for the dropping zone as there are a few accurate maps of the jungle and navigation often calls for a good deal of guesswork. Our English dropping crew swap yarns about their last leave in Singapore and curse the steamy heat that rises from the jungle below. Here, this should be it. We seem to be pretty near our first dropping zone so we'll go down and have a look.
When they hear the plane, the men below put out their identification letters and direct us to the dropping zone over a short-range radio. Hello, DZ Baker. This is Sawdust Able. Can you see us? If so, send up your smoke signal. As a guide to wind direction, the Army puts up a smoke signal and the pilot makes a test run to get the lie of the land. All dropping is done from under 300 feet to prevent supplies from drifting into the jungle or to terrorists nearby. That's low flying in rough country like this and our Dakota does things she was never meant to do. That's all for this dropping zone, so we move on to our next job nearby. This is a drop with a difference. Terrorists are in control of the road approach to the iron mine below and recently ambushed the pay track, so now we drop the payroll. 9,000 Malayan dollars, and to think we had our hands on it. As we approach our second dropping zone, we run into a low cloud, and it looks as though we'll have trouble finding the spot, but it soon clears and we run in for our first drop. Flying at this level puts a heavy strain on the plane and pilot, but it's the only way we can be sure the boys on the ground will get their supplies, and that's the important thing as the sort of war they're fighting down there is no picnic. It may be only a small-scale war, but for these men living and fighting in the hot, steamy jungle, it's a tough, grim business. But with the help of the Air Force, they are making slow but steady progress. In their fight, they have the support of the vast majority of Malayans who have reacted against the murders and crimes of the small communist minority and are cooperating with the government in restoring law and order. There is still a long way to go and much to be done, but in their struggle to rid themselves of their lawless minority, the government and people of Malaya are receiving the assistance, not only of Britain, but also of their good neighbours, Australia and New Zealand. 